And so welcome everybody. This is the to the Florida Friendly Landscaping Crash Course Program today is entitled From the Ground Up. And in the past, uh, we do this program each quarter. And today's program, this is the fourth uh, installment of this year's Crash Course Program. So many of you have probably been to, to the programs throughout the year, but at each quarter program, we talk about or put emphasis on different principles of the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program, and just to learn a little bit more about, about the program and how we can use that within our landscapes. So uh, I want to thank everybody for coming, and we actually have a really cool panel that's with us today. We have our Master Gardener volunteers that are here to help answer any questions that you have. Feel free to put those in the Q&A uh, box as part of this webinar. Uh, put your questions in there and they can help respond to any of those uh, that you you put in there and they'll sh we can share some links and other uh, additional information. Uh, also, we have uh, Stacy Greco with us today. She is with Alachua County Environmental Protection Department and she's going to kind of kick us off today talking a little bit about Florida's water resources. So uh, when, as we move forward, we're going to have this, we're going to have this recorded. We're going to post it onto our YouTube channel. Uh, so you can always come back and revisit parts of the webinar, uh, but feel free to send us those questions in the Q&A and we'll respond to those. And uh, always feel free to reach out to me or anybody else at the UFIFAS Extension Alachua County if you have any questions about today's program. So I'd like to go ahead and uh, let me make sure that I got the right thing going. Um, at the end of today's program, when we conclude, you'll be able to answer essentially these big three questions is what is the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program? Why is soil important in my landscape? And what are ways to improve soil in my landscape? So we chose the from the ground up is just because when we think about our landscape, sometimes we always forget about soil or we don't think about it completely, but it is actually, it is the foundation of a successful garden. And I mean, it's the foundation of just the successful environment. So learning about its role and how it plays a significant role in the landscape and yards that we manage, it's really important that we talk about it, especially in the context of the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program. So to start off, I want to, I think this is when we switch over yeah, we're going to switch this over to Stacy, and Stacy has a presentation where she's going to talk a little bit about Florida's water resources. All right. Well, thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, let's see. I am Stacy Greco, and I am the Water Resources Program Manager with the Alachua County Environmental Protection Department. Let me move us out of the way. How does that look, Taylor? Looks it, okay? looks, it looks good. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so I, I have the pleasure of working with Taylor across the street with the county. And I'm just going to tell the big picture about our water situation here in Alachua County. And a lot of it um, um, applies if we've got neighbors from other counties here on this webinar today. So the big picture, you probably recognize planet Earth, the water planet. Um, we are blessed to have so much water, but only 1% of that water on the planet is readily available for our human use. A lot of it is in the oceans or in salt or, or um, in ice, I'm sorry, or very deep down. So while we might have this illusion of having a lot of water, um, we still need to conserve water because a lot of it is not available for our use. And we also have um, issues with our water being polluted, mainly by too many nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus. And I know this is something that Taylor and the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program focuses on also. So where do we get our water from? This is a great image um, by John Moran. And this is our aquifer. This is underneath our feet. And you know, not everywhere is it these really big caves that cave divers can go in and explore. Um, the aquifer is like Swiss cheese. So it's got some small holes and that just water can move through. And then it's got some of these big caverns, especially in the western part of Alachua County. We tend to have more of this type of um, geology. We call it karst geology. So we get our water from the aquifer beneath us. So we get it from our private wells or from municipal wells from those of us that purchase our water. 
And perhaps you've seen this on a billboard around town. So this is um, hot off the press. Um, the USGS, um, the United States Geologic Survey does reports every five years on how, how we use our water. So this is the Alachua County data from 2015. And this shows in million gallons per day, how we're using our water. So um, here in Alachua County, we mostly use it for public supply. So 23 million gallons a day. And that means that's water that we're all buying from a utility. So that is, um, let me click, oops, let me go back. Let's see. So that is um, mostly water for our homes and our businesses. So this also would include commercial sites. So we're using 23 million gallons a day. It is blue, that means it's metered. We feel pretty confident about that number. The red numbers on this chart are estimated. So agriculture is our second largest water user in Alachua County. And we're a little bit over 15 million gallons per day. And that's, um, some agriculture water use is metered and we are moving more towards that. The water management districts are getting better data on actual um, water use from our farms, but some of it is still estimated based on crop coverage, um, rainfall data, and um, the, um, the IFAS rates of how much those crops need. Domestic wells, so that's private wells. If you live in a rural area, again, that's estimated. Um, there's not meters on those wells, so it's just based on kind of the public supply, average water use is then applied um, to people with wells. So that's our third largest use here. Power production, pretty small. Golf courses, pretty small here in Alachua County. And industrial, commercial that has its own wells and mining, also very small here in Alachua County but every county is different. I know you might not be able to see all of this, but we made this, um, this is 2005 data where it looks at all the surrounding counties and the pie charts are in proportion to how much groundwater is used in that county. The light blue, that's that public supply and the dark blue as wells. So you can kind of look at the blues here and think of those as um, residential use and green is agriculture. So you can see kind of depending on where you are, you know, our neighbors in Levy and Gilchrist and Suwannee County, mostly green. Most of the water use is ag in those areas. Closer to the East Coast, it's more of that public supply. It's more of that residential use that is driving it. So since residential water use is our largest use here in Alachua County, how are we typically using that water? And that's what this pie chart here says. And the take home here is that if there's an irrigation system, outdoor water use is by far that largest use. And this is at almost 60% of that total residential water budget is used outdoors. And this is why the Water 2070 report, which was looking at um, population growth in our water, um, they identified that the single most effective strategy to reduce water demand in Florida is to significantly reduce the amount of water used for landscape irrigation. And the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program is a big part of that. So looking at local landscape irrigation, we know that there's close to 20,000 landscape irrigation systems within Alachua County. This doesn't include agriculture, this is just pretty much yards. And we know that um, homes that have irrigation use a lot more water. So this was a study that the university did, um, it's a few years old now, but looking at newer construction at the time. And if a house had irrigation, it used on average 358 gallons per day compared to 190 for homes without irrigation. And we also, there's a trend that most new construction has irrigation installed, that that's just the default. So we know that we really need to be making sure that those systems are um, installed efficiently and that the property owners are operating them to be efficient. Because our landscaping choices can affect our water quantity and our quality. Because remember that water is coming up from the aquifer and it can affect water quality by um, washing nutrients off also. So 
our fertilizers or if we're using reclaimed water to irrigate, that has nutrients in it. So our landscape, managing them properly is really important to protecting our water. So water quality, um, several water bodies in Alachua County are impaired due to excessive nutrients. So we're really talking about nitrogen and phosphorus, and that includes Noonan's Orange, Lockloosa, and Vivid's Arm lakes, the Alachua Sink, so that's um, Payne's Prairie, the Santa Fe River, and mostly the sources of those nutrients are fertilizers, so that can be from agriculture or from our urban landscapes, storm water, so that storm water can wash that fertilizer in nitrogen that's kind of deposited um, from the atmosphere, it can wash that into our water bodies. Wastewater, so this can be um, from agriculture or domestic. So um, when we flush our toilets, it's all going to either a septic system or to a wastewater treatment facility. And both of those can be sources of nutrients. So Alachua County, we have landscaping strategies to try to mitigate the impacts. And we are trying to shift our landscaping paradigm to really change um, what we're demanding from our landscapes. Can we have a, a nice attractive yard that isn't um, causing water pollution and depleting our groundwater? And we largely do that with education. We do a lot with social media. We do programs like this. We have television commercials and billboards. And we have our turf swap rebate program for people that are wanting to switch out from an intensive landscape. Um, they can get a 50% rebate up to $1,500. We also try to reduce irrigation and fertilizer use using regulatory tools. We have an irrigation efficiency design code for all new irrigation systems. We have irrigation restrictions, so what days of the week, and hopefully everyone, when you changed your clocks back this year, I mean, either turn that irrigation system off or at a minimum made it so it's just you're getting one day a week. We also have a fertilizer code and a homeowners association Florida Friendly Landscaping Code that can help homeowners that are wanting to adopt Florida Friendly Landscaping um, in their yards but are having some barriers. So protecting our water makes economic sense. Our lakes, springs, and rivers are economically important for tourism. We had a grant in 2013 that we just looked at um, the financial contributions from recreation in the Santa Fe Springs region, and it was 84 million just in recreation. And that was 2013. That was, you know, before Airbnb was big. So we get a lot more tourism in this area now. Um, <clears throat> you can save money now on your bills if you start conserving water and a lot later. Um, alternative water supplies will be much more expensive. Groundwater is the least expensive, least energy intensive source of water available to us. So conservation, that's the low hanging fruit that we all need to work on together. This is my contact information and Taylor always knows how to find me. So I don't know, Taylor, well, I guess we're not doing Q&A now. People are putting it in the chat. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you. So uh, thank you, Stacy. And we did have one question that popped up and said, how do we, how can we get copies of the codes that you mentioned? Yes. So if you go to alachuacountywater.org, that's our website. Um, and there is, I think it's called codes and compliance. We have a great page that now breaks it out by fertilizer, irrigation, Florida friendly, um, and I can also email that to you or Taylor can, but if you go to alachuacountywater.org and go to codes and regulations, you should find that. And it's got um, little descriptions of the codes and then it also has the actual code language for those that like to read that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because those links, they take you to the Muni code website, right? Yeah. Correct. So um, we'll have one of the master gardeners go ahead and they'll they'll get that link and they'll put that in the the chat for you all um, and when we'll have a follow-up email or I'll follow up with uh, a copy of the presentation as well as um, some of the resources and links that are relevant to today's presentation so you will get that sent to you um, so I'll go ahead and I'll pick it up from there because I think one of the biggest things that um, 
Stacy was able to hit on was talking about water use and the importance of water and how we're seeing the different water is how that water is being used throughout Alachua County and in, even in the state. Um, so that kind of talks about the crux of what we're here today is that Florida Friendly Landscaping Program. So what is it? It's an integrative approach to maintaining an attractive, colorful, and diverse yard. It's friendly to wildlife. It's environmentally responsible and less work than a traditional landscape, kind of, because you can still make it a high maintenance landscape depending on what you're how you want to create that landscape. But nonetheless, its ultimate goals really come down to conserving water and protecting water quality. So each of the principles that we have as part of the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program really come back to water quality and water quantity. But we'll build more on that, especially when we're in that framework of the soils discussion for this evening. But the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program is comprised of nine principles. So these nine principles are whoop, right plant, right place, water efficiently, fertilize appropriately, mulch, attract wildlife, manage yard pests, recycle, reduce stormwater runoff, and protect the waterfront. So each one of these principles, you know, you kind of look at them, and they all have different types of behaviors or management practices that relate to our landscapes. So right plant, right place, mulch and recycle. Those are going to be the big ones that we kind of talk about a little bit or going to put more emphasis on tonight. But they're all really important and it always starts with right plant, right place. If you take a plant, plant material and you're trying to plan your landscape, you know, plants prefer specific environmental conditions. You know, some prefer full sun, some might prefer uh, full shade. Others might have different preferences in moisture availability as well as the climate differences. So if we take those plants and we uh, say we're planting our yard and our landscape. We know what areas have full sun, which ha areas have full shade, and we match the plants to their preferred conditions, those plants are gonna naturally thrive. They're gonna have a higher pest resistance, overall maintenance is gonna de decrease, um, and just overall maintenance will decrease as well. But that starts with that right plant, right place. And if you start with right plant, right place, everything else starts to fall in line. So like water and when they're in that happy place, they require substantially less water and other inputs like fertilizers to help make sure that they are maintained. Um, but the second principle is that water efficiently. That is how are we irrigating the landscape and how can we make sure that we're irrigating the landscape as effectively as possible. Now, if we plant drought tolerant plants and that are that right plant with the right place, you immediately have reductions in the amount of water that you can, that you need to put in the landscape. Fertilizing appropriately is really looking at what are the plants in the landscape, what are they deficient in, and making sure that we're applying nutrients at the appropriate timing based off of our uh, our soils and our plant material that we're growing to help make sure that the uptake is as efficient as possible. Fourth one is mulch, and that's just the, what is that mulch and what type of mulch are you using and how is it being used in the landscape? And that has a huge impact on your landscape quality. The fifth one that attracts wildlife is how do we bring different wildlife pollinators, birds, other mammals into our landscape or at least create a space for them as they're passing through. It provides the resources that they need. Uh, the managed yard pest is, you know, whether it be disease or insects, any type of landscape pest, how do we manage those as appropriately as possible? So we're reducing the amount of inputs that we have to put in. And again, that goes back to right plant, right place. If you have pest resistant plants or plants that thrive, they're gonna have a natural resistance or a higher resistance to pest pressure. The seventh one is recycle. So recycling, again, that's one of the ones we're gonna talk about tonight. Recycling is looking at how do we take the plant material around our landscape or within our landscape and how do we bring it back in in a beneficial way. The eighth one is reduced stormwater runoff. So as we change landscape land use types from like, you know, permeable natural areas to impermeable surfaces like roadways and sidewalks or homes, we have a increased amount of stormwater that we create. So how can we capture and use that stormwater before letting it enter the storm drain? And what by using that water, we have the ability to clean it, but as well use it to help irrigate uh, our land, our plant material potentially. Um, and then the last one is 
protect the waterfront. So if you're interested in learning more about any of these, reach out to our county extension office um, and we have or any county extension office in Florida. And then uh, we have all the materials and guides. Uh, they're all resources online as well. But if you wanna watch other videos that are part of this quarterly series, you can always check out our YouTube page, UF IFAS Extension Alachua County, and you'll find each of the other videos and we hit these other principles in a little bit more depth. But we're gonna talk specifically more about the right plant, right place, mulch and recycle. But before we do that, let's talk about soils. I want us to kind of get a really strong, firm understanding of soil. So let's talk about the dirt on soil. And I always like to say dirt is what you get on your pants. Soil is what we have on the ground. So um, what in the chat box, uh, what, what is this in this picture? What are you looking at? Let me know. Feel free to put your response in that chat box. Do you know what type of soil that is? You can open up your chat box and put in what you think it is or what, what are you looking at? Yeah, it's a sandy soils. Mm -hmm. Beach sand, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so um, there's a few Whoops. So um, yeah, so it's like we're looking at the side. So that's what we call a soil horizon. So it's like a cutaway of the soil and we're looking as it, as it goes deeper and deeper uh, into the ground. And what you're specifically looking at, and we'll talk a little bit more about this specific image, but this is Mayaka soil or Mayaka soil. It's actually the state soil of Florida. So many of you probably look at this and say, that is very familiar Florida. Uh, f very familiar looking soil, especially in Alachua County in the center part of the state. This is our most common soil type that we have. So, um, but let's talk about what soil is and um, we'll kind of, you know, just learn a little bit about it and how we develop a strong, rich soil. Because if we have a strong soil, we can have a much healthier, Florida-friendly landscape. So when we think about soil, we always think about soil texture. That's one of the terms that we use. And soil texture is comprised of three ma major components, sand, silt, and clay. And it's predominantly based off of essentially the particle size. So when you go to the beach, you can hold that sand and you can see those in individual grains. Uh, grains of sand, and they're usually ranging from that 0.05 to 2 millimeters. And our smallest is clay particles. So clay, they are going to be, oh, it says greater than, sorry, it should be less than that 0 0.002 millimeters. So they are the smallest uh, soil particles that we have in the landscape. So when you're thinking about soil, what type of soil do you, I mean, do you classify Florida as having? Go ahead and put that in the uh, chat box. Yeah. Yeah, just very sandy, sandy, sandy soil. Ah, one person said loamy sand. Pretty close, yeah. So what we do is we look, if you go, you can go into your yard and you can grab like a handful of soil and there's different ways that you can kind of determine what that percent make up of uh, your soil texture is. Now in Florida, we're predominantly sand, but in some areas you do this thing called ribboning where you can actually build ribbons you have a ball of soil and you can actually form ribbons really easily between your forefinger and your thumb. And the longer the ribbon, the more clay particles you have within uh, that soil sample. But all of our soils is just a combination of sand, silt, and clay. And what, what that texture does or that overall soil texture, it can determine a lot of, uh, it, determines a lot. So it can determine our nutrient availability, um, the moisture retention, what type of habitat you might have within the soil, uh, drainage, 
how well drained or how poorly drained a soil is, as well as like pH buffering. So that's just what the soil texture kind of determines. And we'll talk a little bit more about these specific ones and why they're important. But what are some, what, when you think of Florida soils and you're looking at these, what soil texture determines, you know, what do you think of like nutrient availability or uh, like habitat or those texture, to, those texture items, those bolted items, what's one of the ones that you think about specifically? Or like what is a result of our sandy soils? And you can put that in the chat box. Yeah, it creates a lot of habitat. Yeah, water loss. So our, yeah, our sandy soils that, yeah, the water just drains really, 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 really quickly. How many of you have done a soil test? If you've done a soil test, um, yeah, yeah, a lot of, not a lot of nutrients. Very, a lot of those nutrients infiltrate into the soil very, very quickly. Um, and yeah, doing a soil test. If you haven't done one, I recommend doing that regularly um, at minimum once a year. Some people do it twice a year to really have a good understanding of what's happening in your soil so you know how to fertilize appropriately. But when we look at the soil texture, you know, like ideal, it really depends on what you're growing. But if you're going to ask a farmer, what's your ideal soil condition? Um, they are going to kind of point around in that area. They may have a little bit more, less sand, and maybe a little bit more of the clay. Kind of that loamy area is going to be most important to them because having that good balance of drainage, nutrient availability, um, and pH buffering is going to be incredibly important to a lot of our agriculture growers. But like many of you know, in Florida, we are more like down here. <laughs> We're in that sand or loamy sand. Now, that's not the entire state. There are pockets where we do have loamy soils, and we have really good, actually, ag production on them, and our landscapes do really well um, or have a do really well with the nutrient availability, et cetera. But you know, we start to say, and you, you mentioned in the comments that, you know, drainage is in, is impacted or is really well drained, but we also lose a lot of our nutrients with it as well. And that nutrient loss is one of those contributors to non-point source pollutant pollution that has an impact on our water quality. So, you know, so let's look a little bit deeper in this. Um, so when we're look, so we have soil texture, but now let's look at soil profile and we'll start to see where it's really important to think about our soil. So there's different layers. They're kind of like a cake or an onion, if you get my, re my Shrek reference, but, um, and these different horizons that we call them or layers, they're like different degrees of which stuff is broken down. Um, the, the very, very top layer, that's like that organic matter that's breaking down and then that really rich hummus or humus, it's that soil rich stuff that's like, ah, that's the stuff I really like. Um, you know, you have like your top soil, which, which is really rich in organic matter, but then you, but then what happens as things get a little bit further down, you get to what this is, this E horizon, and it's an area of leaching. So there's high leaching and a lot of nutrient loss, and it works its way down to the zone of accumulation. And in Florida, that zone of accumulation could be where we have part of our unconfined aquifer kind of hanging out. And it's just nutrients going directly into the aquifer at that point. And then some, then when you get further down, you can get like unbroken rocks or it's like really big aggregates down to then what that R layer, which would be the parent material or bedrock. Um, so when we look at soil, those are the different horizons that we can see. So let's go back to that Mayaka soil, uh, that image that we had earlier. So you can see um, we have the A, sorry, the O, E, sorry, O, A, E, and B layers within the soil profile. So we're looking at a cutaway of that Mayaka soil, which is that common soil type uh, throughout Florida. And in the soil, that organic layer, it is just the very 
very thin layer, that O layer, very, very thin layer um, that is on the very surface of the soil. And then that A layer, you can kind of see it, but it looks like a, a a little a dark band, a darker band that runs right along the top. That's that A layer. So that's where you're having like nutrient rich soil. And then um, in that E horizon, that's where it's just heavy leaching is happening through that in soil right there, that profile. And you can actually see that discoloration. It's more of a fine white sand versus that darker sand above it. And then you get down to that B, which is like that zone of accumulation layer. And that's where a lot of those nutrients are sitting. And that's also heavy, can be a very heavy saturated area, depending on where the water table is. And that's where you can have direct interaction with the aquifer. And then any misapplied nutrients or mismanaged landscapes, that's an easy way for some of our nutrients to get into the aquifer and contribute to non-point source pollutants. So if I were to tell you like, what is the most important layer um, when looking at this? It's that O layer. It's that very, 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 very thin layer at the top of that soil profile. That's where if you can manage that O layer and um, you're gonna have a very healthy O and A layer and you're gonna actually reduce the amount of pollutants that end up uh, leaching through the soil and you'll have a much healthier landscape. So let's talk about the benefits of what's happening within that O layer of the, the soil. So it can stabilize soil pH. And when it stabilizes soil pH, what that can do is that can help supply nutrients to the plant material or the organic matter in that humus can help provide nutrients to plant material. And we call that the cation exchange capacity. So that content of what's within or that soil texture or soil type that's in that organic layer, that'll determine what type of nutrients are available. Um, they can help maintain soil structure. They can supply energy as well as they can remove harmful pollutants. But it really, again, it goes back to the type of O layer that you have in your landscape. So let's put this in a little bit of context and we'll hit a little bit more on like that cation exchange capacity because that's really important when we talk about non-point source pollutants and if we're fertilizing our landscapes, that importance of having a high cation exchange capacity or the ability for your plants to be able to hold on to your soil to be able to hold on to nutrients a little bit better for your plants to uptake them. So let's jump into this link, see if it plays here. I may have to go into the, yeah, let me go ahead and do a switch share screen because rather than talking to you all about it, I have a uh, video about it. So you're looking at the live screen, okay. So can you all see uh, the video on your screens? Can you all see that? Yes, okay, cool, cool. Oh, I hit the wrong button. Okay, so here we go. Not all soils are created equal, and if it weren't for chemistry, we wouldn't be able to grow many crops here, nor here, nor here. It's like this. Soils are composed of sand, silt, clay, and organic matter. Some have more sand, others more clay. Each soil's unique blend determines its color, texture, and storage capacity for nutritious chemicals. Although incredibly small, nutrients still need their space. And by space, we mean the area surrounding the soil's tiny particles. Keep in mind that surface area is not the same as particle size. For example, clay particles are tiny compared to sand, but they have more than a thousand times as much external surface area as the particles in an equal volume of sand. However, if a nutrient just sits there unattached, it will likely leach out from the soil when it rains and will not be available for plants. Remember that time when you rubbed a balloon on your best friend's hair and stuck it to a wall? Well, a similar phenomenon occurs in the soil. Through their electrostatic energy, nutrients cling on to clay particle surfaces. 
Nutrients like calcium, magnesium, potassium, and ammonium are all positively charged chemicals, or cations. And as it turns out, most clay particles and organic matter in soil are negatively charged. So, many nutrients are positive and particles are negative. Perfect. In chemistry, as in romance, opposites attract. Good. No more leaching. But like the balloon on the wall, the nutrients are only temporarily held. In fact, there's actually a shell of water molecules that forms around the cation, preventing it from bonding permanently. This shell is often called a hydration sphere. But that's a whole other video. So, back to cations. Basically, if a plant wants a nutritious cation like potassium, it will need to exchange it for another cation or cations of equal charge. Luckily, plants produce hydrogen cations that they can exchange. One hydrogen cation for one potassium cation. Easy enough. But for nutrients with a positive charge of two, like calcium, two hydrogen cations are needed. The higher the positive charge, the harder it gets to exchange or trade cations. That's because a cation with high positive charge and small size is preferentially held by the soil over those with lower charge or larger size, meaning that a large cation with a positive charge of 1 will be the first to be released. A divalent cation having a charge of 2 will be released more easily than a cation with a positive charge of 3. Whether they are held tightly or not, the nutrients are available to the plant in exchange for other cations. Not all nutrients are cations, however. Some are actually negatively charged compounds, or anions. Since anions, like nitrate or sulfate, have a negative charge, they are unable to attach themselves to negatively charged particles and, as a result, leach out when watered. Of course, all soils are different. There are soils in the tropics, for example, that have positively charged soil particles. And in that case, it's the anions, not cations, that are held temporarily and then exchanged with other anions. Most soils, however, have negatively charged particles. The more negatively charged a soil is and the more surface area a soil has, the more cation exchange capacity it has. This is such an important factor for plant growth that scientists measure a soil's cation exchange capacity, CEC, in order to help farmers determine how much and how often fertilization is needed. That's because CEC is sort of like a cup size at a fast food joint. Some soils are supersized, but others have a kitty cup. Pouring too much will just cause a mess, but if you refill several times, you can still quench your thirst. Farming in low CEC soils works almost the same way. Even though the soil has lower capacity, you can fertilize more often using smaller amounts and the plants will grow healthy and strong. And it's a good thing, too. Otherwise, we'd have very little land to farm. So the fact that farmers can grow crops almost anywhere kind of seems like superhero powers. But really, it's just knowing about chemistry. All right, so what did you all think about that? That I found that actually today, instead of lecturing, having a really cheesy animation, I found that and I was like, oh, that's fun. <laughs> so, uh, all right, so I think is the, the, I think, I believe the PowerPoint is back up. So, um, you know, one of the disclaimers that I would say on there is, Everything that they were mentioning about the cation exchange capacity is absolutely correct. You know, if if I were looking at, at an agricultural grower, some guy, somebody in Florida that was growing corn versus somebody up in like the Midwest, say Iowa, um, the the grower in Iowa they have more amounts of clay in their soils, so they have a much higher cation exchange capacity. So it holds on to nutrients really, really well compared to our sandy or sandy loam soils. So the growers in Iowa can grow way more or yield a lot more corn per acre than someone in Florida just because of that CEC capacity or that CEC. Um, but I would always recommend, no matter what, always do that soil test. If you're going to fertilize, do a soil test 
determine what your soil conditions are. So, and then follow the IFAS recommendations regarding our nutrient management and fer or fertilizing. But anyways, so we learned about cation exchange capacity and I like to bring that up because when we're talking about how we're managing landscapes, our soil type plays a major role in that. So if we're looking, going back to that O layer, you know, we're thinking about that. Um, Florida has a lot of sandy soils. So do you think that has a high or low CEC or cation exchange capacity? Put that in the uh, chat box and let me know. Yeah, yeah, low, has a low cation exchange capacity because they don't, the surface areas, total surface area is reduced because of how large the grains are um, of the sand and they're not, neg they don't have that negative charge to them. So they're not holding on the nutrients really well. And that's one reason why like our potassium is always deficient. If you do a soil test, you're gonna be deficient in potassium because it has a really weak bond to the soil. So you end up just losing it quickly compared to some of the others like the iron, which might have, um, which has a stronger hold on whatever clay particles that you may have within, um, within the soil. But anyways, <clears throat> before I lose my voice. But let's talk a little bit about that O layer because we're gonna come back to this, right? This is gonna build more. So let's talk about that O layer. So the O layer, you know, that's that organic matter. That organic matter, that's help building that top soil. So it's increasing the amount of different types of particles that you have um, within the soil. And it is what we consider as, probably the, it is the most important soil horizon, but it only makes up 5% of soil volume, you know, like on average. Um, but in Florida, it's only about one to 3% of Florida's sandy soils. And it's actually significantly less in urban or disturbed areas. A lot of our new developments were just using that archer fill, which is just the clean sand. A lot of landscapes in Florida are being built on a soil profile that essentially has nearly zero organic matter. So it has a huge impact on those benefits that we get from having a healthy uh, O layer within our landscape, because it's going to prevent things like essentially this, having a healthy O layer. I mean, this is an iconic example of poor agricultural practices, but also just the impacts of not managing the soils appropriately and having that little or no organic material, you know, that loss of agriculture, but that same idea, the same best manager practices for our landscapes and how we're managing our landscapes is really important, especially we're thinking about nutrients that could leach through the soil. So um, what I want us to do is I want to show you like a really cool online resource. This is called the Web Soil Survey. So, you know, if you live in a new development, more than likely you're on a landscape that is just pretty much just sand um, and it has very little organic content to it. So let me go ahead and reshare this other screen. It's called the Web Soil Survey. Um, and you'll again, you'll get this link sent to you. Um, let me pull up that. So this is the Web Soil Survey. Um, they haven't updated this page in a really long time, but it's very informative. So you can start this Web Soil Survey um, and it brings you to this really cool, just, just a map of the United States and you have your tools up at the top. Um, excuse me. Oh, thank you for putting that in there, Mark, in the chat box. So uh, we have these tools at the top. You go to this zoom in and let's just zoom in to uh, parts of Florida. So I would recommend, it's just a fun thing to go play around, find your home on this webpage and just see what you can find. So I'm gonna zoom into a random spot here in Alachua County. Um, then you have to do the same where you select your area of interest. Um, so you select that tool and you kind of just select that general area. Again, it could be a parcel um, or it can be a larger area. And then it starts to pull up the information that they have from USDA um, or the Natural Resource Conservation Service for this soil type. So um, up at the top, there's these different tabs. So we just chose the area of interest. Um, so that area of interest at the very top, 
that's that first thing that we did is like, okay, that's the area that we want to get information about. Then you can click on the second tab, which is just soil map. So you click on soil map and it gives you a generalized soil survey. So this is based off of just data that we have for years and years. Uh, sometimes that's resurfaced and updated, but all these little numbers and blobs, they coordinate to a different soil type, which is really, really neat. So um, of this total area, let's see here, see if I can, whoop. So this area that I chose is actually really large. I didn't think I picked 13,000 acres, but um, of that 13,000, 29.1% is this Pomona sand. So it's a very specific type of sand and you can click on it um, and it'll give you some information about that specific soil type. So what I really like about it is it tells you kind of landform, um, but it gives you information about that typical soil profile. Now I see you're seeing like this, uh, these specific like BH, BTG, um, those all relate, those are specific sand profile or soil profile codes. Um, but anyway, so that shows you what that profile is and roughly like what that depth is or where you're seeing it. So you can see that sand is existing in upwards of the first 43 inches of the soil profile before you get to like a sandy clay loam. And that's at just 49 to 69 and then it goes down to 84 but, um, inches. But other things that's really neat is like runoff class, it's high, has poorly drained soils. Um, so it pulls up some really neat information about that soil. Some of it, like I have no clue what this is telling me because I'm not a soil scientist, but when I'm like just looking at general soil conditions, this has a lot of that information that I really like. So one other thing I like to do is I can go to the Soil Data Explorer, that next tab. And what I like to do with this is it, when you click on it, it brings up these additional like little um, tabs that you can click on, but I like the suitabilities and limitations for use. So if I was going to, this is all very generalized, of course, but if I clicked on construction materials and say, oh, let me go to building site development. And I wanted to build a home with um, concrete, I can click on that. This is that corrosion of concrete. So based off of the soil conditions, it can anticipate how quickly um, your soil could corrode or that concrete could corrode. So you just go to like click G rating and then you'll see it get all color coded. <laughs> so you see there's a lot of areas, this whole area based off of their standards, their benchmarks, all those areas would have high corrosion rates of concrete. Um, and you can always get some more information that you pull up. But I, I encourage everyone to kind of explore this. It's a fun resource to kind of just get general information about your soil conditions. And when you are looking for the area of interest, down at the bottom of this page, you can actually type in like specific addresses and stuff like that. So, but that's just a fun resource that you can always look at. But seeing, without having to dig down, you can actually see what those soil profiles are and just learn a little bit about what's happening underneath your uh, landscape. So let me go ahead and op open up our presentation again. So, um, so we talked about the different soil conditions. So we have, uh, we mentioned that the soil texture and the soil profile and in it, it, its impact on determining like nutrient holding capacity, that's at CEC, soil pH, et cetera, and that importance of that O layer. So what we'd really like to say is, you know, if we're talking about the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program, do we have the ability to help build a healthier and stronger soil within our landscape? It's like, absolutely. And this is one of the big things that we think about, especially if you're within the urban areas where you have limited to no organic material. So we're going to talk about those main three principles now, that right plant, right place, mulch, and recycle, and how they can be strategies to have a healthy landscape or to create a healthy landscape that increases that cation exchange capacity, increases the amount of organic material that you have available very easily. Um, so let's go ahead and we'll jump, we'll, we'll jump right into this. So 
So the first one, right plant, right place. So this is a standard one that I always like to talk about. So right plant, right place. Um, so in this image, this is obviously, this is coral ardesia. This is one of our most invasive species that we have, at least here in Alachua County and all over parts of the state. This coral ardesia is, um, let me see if I can hide this, I apologize. Okay, so um, that right plant, right place, you know, from that context or that very specific context of um, choosing plant material based off of those environmental conditions, you know, soil has a big impact on that. So if you live in a landscape that you don't have a very good soil, you have limited organic matter, you know, it might be important to think about what are those plants that can thrive in those conditions. So typically in situations like that, you're going to have landscape, you're going to have landscapes that are going to be well drained because or higher likelihood of being very well drained because the amount of sand in them. So you're going to need plants that do well on limited amount of water. They have, they're very drought tolerant. But again, it really depends on your, your environmental conditions. So selecting right plant, right place is going to really help you out because if you plant, if you plant and select uh, material, plant material to go into your landscape that fits those environmental conditions, they're going to thrive. And it's going to reduce the amount of inputs that you need in your landscape. So, um, you know, if we think about right plant, right place, um, any landscape material that's going to require any type of fertilizer, you know, it's going to be the wrong plant in the wrong place if you have to put excess of fertilizer or excess of moisture down and try to keep it alive because that just means it's the wrong plant in the wrong place. But if you have the ability to follow uh, IFAS recommendations, you can get plants established and you can even turn off irrigation and follow very basic uh, nutrient management guides, guidelines, and you can have an incredibly healthy landscape that we know has very minimal impacts, uh, zero to minimal impacts on uh, water uh, assuming it's being managed appropriately. So right plant, right place. So if you have a very bad, poor soil, you can find plants that actually fit those conditions and can thrive. But then you have the ability to help build that soil over time to increase that organic matter and increase a healthier and create a healthier uh, soil. So one of the ways that you can do that is to help build up soil um, is through mulch. Principle number four is that, or mulch principle. And one of the things that's really nice about this is mulch has a lot of great benefits. It has it's an aesthetic quality to it. So you can apply mulch and uh, like you all know, you put it down, it makes the landscape look really cohesive and nice. But that mulch will slowly break down and it can help provide a lot of organic material to the soil as it slowly breaks down. And that can help um, with soil moisture retention. It can help increase the cation exchange capacity. Um, but again, sometimes that organic material is burned off pretty quickly or it can be burned off quickly. So it's not gonna be persistent there, but you can always net organic matter depending and have it grow over time, um, depending on how you're managing the landscape. But mulch, you know, you wanna put down a few inches of mulch in your landscape because what it can do is it can help reduce uh, weed pressure by suppressing the weeds, and it can help um, increase uh, moisture availability uh, to the plants by preventing that water from evaporating too quickly. Um, but it's important not to have it too deep because too deep of the mulch will end up causing um, fungus issues or anything like, or other things like that to pop up within your landscape as well, you know, like a happy medium. But um, anyways, so mulch, you can apply it to your landscape and as it breaks down, it can provide those nutrients that you need to have a healthy landscape to help build up that organic matter within your landscape. And there's, a, and it's, you know, when we think of mulch, we might think of like those good mulch, like, like pine bark, pine needles, um, malaleuca, uh, eucalyptus could be another one. But it's important to think like other mulches that work great is this natural leaf litter. That leaf litter that falls out of the trees, um, you can put that in your plant beds and let it serve as mulch as well. You get the same benefit and it does break down quicker compared to some of the hardwood mulches or softwood mulches that we do have like the pine barks. Um, and that breaks down and that can help build that organic matter within your soil. So what is mulch? So it's essentially any material applied to the soil surface to protect 
or improve the covered area. So those benefits, and I pretty much mentioned all these, um, it helps protect plants from mechanical damage. So like string trimmers, lawn mowers, um, anything that you're doing in the landscape, it can help protect them from that mechanical damage by keeping any machinery away from them. Um, mulch improves the soil by breaking down and uh, providing uh, that organic mater material to that top horizon of the soil. Um, helps improve maintenance or is the ease of maintenance to natural weed suppression. It prevents water loss, helps control temperature so you don't have plant stress due to temperature changes, as well as the aesthetic benefits that you can get from it. So we're talking about selecting different mulches. Think about a, uh, aesthetics, longevity, durability, the sources, availability and price, decomposition rates, like how fast will it decompose, um, changes to soil chemistry because sometimes like if you're using like pine straw or pine bark it might help with the acidity of your soil um, and also think about susceptibility to termites you don't want to have um, mulch right up against your house especially if it's deep and not dry um, that's going to just invite termites in and you can end up getting termites into your home but there's different types of mulches that we can use you know bark wood chips, leaves, pine needles, grass clippings, utility mulch, or like just general yard waste. The biggest ones that we have that we don't want people to do is mulches from unsustainable sor sources like cypress or cedar. Um, some of those that you see a lot of people use, but a lot of that's not coming from sustainable sources. Whereas like that pine bark, pine needle, eucalyptus and maluca, or even like that free, uh, mulch that you can get from like your utility providers if they provide that in your county those are all great because a lot of them are sourced locally or they're from sustainable forest uh initiative the sustainable forestry initiative so it's all harvested sustainably so when we think about applying mulch we got to make sure that we're applying it as appropriately as possible so that two to three dent that two to three inch depth helps with that soil uh, that's soil moisture retention. So it's keeping that moisture a little bit better. It is um, not staying too wet. And by holding on that moisture a little bit better, it's gonna prevent excess of nitrogen leaching. Um, and along the, at the base of all your plants and trees, just make sure you keep a, a space. You don't want that mulch actually touching the tree or the shrubs, cause that'll cause them to rot. So the seventh principle is that recycle. So that's like recycling yard waste. So there's so many ways that we can think of, you know, all the nutrients that are free to us within our landscape, things that like our grass clippings or leaves, branches, all of that stuff breaks down the food waste that we have in our kitchens. It can break down and we can uh, take it into our gardens and we can help build that organic matter or that organic layer. Um, in our gardens, or you can take them into like raised beds if you have them. So let's talk about like these four primary strategies for recycling yard waste. So we have mowing, pruning, raking, and composting. So if I was to ask you, um, what is it that, what's wrong with this picture that you see of this kid pushing the lawnmower? Put that in the chat box and, um, Cindy or Frank, I can't get the chat box open. So you may have to, or Christy, you may have to tell me what's being thrown in there. So what is wrong with this image? We're getting in, cutting the grass too low, the bag behind the lawnmower, collecting the grass clippings, catch bag, mowing too low, bagging the leaves, catching clippings. Yeah, so it's definitely, so we, I'm not sure, I, mowing the turf grass too low might be, I can't, I can't tell from this, this image specifically, but the, um, definitely the bagging the clippings. You don't want to bag your clippings. Uh, if you're mowing your grass, just let, let it be a mulching lawnmower. Just let those clippings just lie there because what they're going to do you know, 
in the past, we don't really see it as much anymore, but, you know, people will bag their clippings, they put it in the yard waste and they send it off somewhere else, but that's valuable nutrients, you know, leave it there, let it break down and then just recycle those nutrients back into the plant, allow it to naturally feed the plant material that you have. Um, so in this situation would be, let it just lie within the turf grass and, um, put it back in and let it break down and help cycle those nutrients back into the turf grass. And it's important to also note that, you know, if you ever get grass clippings or anything like that in the roadway, the sidewalks, uh, storm drain area, make sure you clean all of that up because that can end up during any storms in our storm water uh, system. And then as the, those pl that plant material breaks down, those nutrients are released in our water and it can lead to those algal blooms. So mowing, it's as simple as when you mow, just make sure you're leaving the clippings where they're at. Let those clippings break down and just recycle those nutrients back into the plants. The next is pruning. So whenever we're pruning our landscape, you know, think about what are the different what are you removing? Are there different leaves or branches that you can uh, compost or bring back into your landscape. Uh, of course, I wouldn't recommend doing this if any, any of them are diseased or sick, dispose of them. Uh, but anything else that you're just pruning or pruning away from shrubs or trees, get those leaves off, get those branches off and try to incorporate them back into a compost, let them break down and use it as a way to help fuel um, uh, that nutrient recycling within your landscape. The next one is raking. Your natural uh, leaf litter that's falling on your landscape, you can use that leaf litter as mulch um, and you can rake it up and you can put it in your plant beds or you can just let the leaves fall within the plant bed that you've already created and just let that be a natural mulch and that'll break down and it'll help build the soil and help create a stronger soil. And again, creating the stronger soil goes back to you're increasing that organic matter, which helps increase that cation exchange capacity, helps increase that soil moisture retention. So it's helping protect the water resources. Um, and another option that you can do is just, you know, that I like to do, this kind of goes in back and forth between mowing and raking, uh, maybe more so the mowing. Um, but what I'll do is if I have a lot of leaves in my landscape, I just mow them. I just mow over them, they chip up, and then they, they get down into uh, the turf grass and then they just break down right there. Um, so, and then the last one is composting. Um, composting, that is a great way to just take, you, you take what we call your, your greens and your browns. And we have a full other program on it on our YouTube channel that was from just uh, a month and a half ago, I believe, um, that you can, you can watch, learn more about composting. But by composting, taking that, um, material from our landscapes or within our kitchen, mixing them together and you make them, you get them to break down much, much quicker. And by doing so, you're going to create an organic matter that you have the ability to spread in your landscape or throughout your landscape to help improve that organic matter or that organic material within your soil. So we talked about all of these, we talked about the, the nine principles at the beginning, but then we just hit on these three, that right plant, right place, mulch, and recycle. And these three can really help go towards that, how we're thinking about soil from the ground up. If we think about soil health and those conditions of what can help improve soil conditions, we have the ability to have a stronger, healthier, more resilient landscape that helps reduce water quality impacts from like nutrient loss and it helps us use water more efficiently. So it all comes back to that Florida Friendly Landscaping Program and by taking care of our soil, we take care of our landscapes. So what we've been able to do is, I know we're starting to run out of time and we're getting up to our question period, but now that we've gone through all this, you should be able to answer these three questions. What is the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program? Why is soil important in my landscape? And what are the ways to improve soil in my landscape? Um, feel free to reach out to us at any time. Um, again, my name is Taylor Clem. I'm with UF IFAS Extension in Alachua County, and I'm the Environmental and Community Horticulture Agent. We have a bunch of different ways that you can reach out to us. We have our Facebook page, it's the UF IFAS Alachua County Extension Master Gardeners. 
uh, as well as we have our YouTube page, which is UFIFIS Extension Alachua County. And you can watch a lot of our webinars and get updates on different posts and activities, as well as we have a, uh, a podcast uh, that we do monthly, uh, we do have monthly episodes are released um, and it's called Extension Cord and you can find it on all, all the major providers. Um, and this actually the most previous episode that we had from this month is actually with uh, Stacy. Um, and Stacy joined us and we talked, we had a whole episode about Florida's water resources. But anyways, so at this point, what I'd like to do is I'd like to open up the floor to any questions anybody may have about your soil, the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program, or anything like that. And you can put those into Q&A um, and we might be able to catch them in the chat box. Let's see here. So to improve the sandy soil, yeah, it's just all coming down to increasing that organic matter within your soil. So through the composting, trying to get that organic matter to help build, that's going to be the best way to improve your sandy soils. So there are um, other strategies that we can do. We're actually looking at, we have research that's happening right now where you can aerate your landscape like you see people up north do. We don't do it down here because of the sandy soils, but if you can like aerate your landscape and then you can actually apply a thin layer of like compost and that has a huge, that can have a huge impact on landscape quality. So, but we don't have those recommendations yet, but that research is going on right now. So definitely the uh, improving sandy soil through, um, sorry, improving that sandy soils by helping do the strategies with FFL program will help build that organic matter. So we had a question that came in. So uh, one strategy that people do, at least for vegetable gardens, is that they use what's called green manure in raised boxes. And that is essentially a, you can use it as warm or cool season cover crop and you uh, can knock it down and till it into your, uh, into your raised bed. And uh, what that does is that cover crop breaks down and just adds a tremendous amount of organic matter to your garden for subsequent years planting or sub subsequent seasons planting. So what I have um, is a, I'm putting it in the chat box right now. This is a follow-up survey. Uh, this follow-up survey, um, it allows us to kind of learn how we can always improve the programs and make them better. So please take that uh, survey. Oops, I didn't send it to everybody. All right, so please take that survey and help us improve the programs. Oh, we did have um, one thing that came and said, I heard we can add peat moss to increase soil moisture retention. So yes, peat moss can increase that mo moisture retention, but we, we're very cautious on how we're using that because peat moss is not sustainable. It's not harvested sustainably. So um, these methods with our, our, our gardens, like through the composting and helping build and recycling, um, those are going to be your best bets to improve your soil conditions over time, especially with the soil moisture retention. All right. Any other questions? Thank you. Yeah, so when I think of soil, uh, depending on who you talk to, some people say there needs to be a 10th principle for the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program just called soil. 
<laughs> because it's true. If, um, I mean, under right plant, right place conditions, we have the ability to have a landscape that does really well, even in those really poor soil conditions. Um, but it does make it, still makes it a little bit harder. But if we think about improving soil condition by just doing some of these best management practices, your garden will improve significantly over time. I mean, you talk to some gardeners that have been managing their garden for years, they would love to talk to you about their soil. Like, oh, I moved here, it was just a, a void, there was nothing good in the soil. And now look at it and they'll pull some of it away. It's this dark organic humus that their plants are just loving. So um, it's a wonderful thing. But thank you all for joining us today. And we'll follow up with some additional resources um, through email um, for everyone that's regist that registered um, later on this week. So make sure you go tell all your friends the importance of soil. <laughs> Thank you all. <laughs> it's not just dirt. <laughs> Oh, we have something coming to QA. Oh, how do you till? So yeah, how do you till an 18 inch by 24 inch grow box? You you have to do it with just like the hand tills. The small, it it stinks. <laughs> um, sometimes people, because of what you're growing and it's small, you can't just lay it flat. You can remove it, you can chip it up and break it down, and then you can mix it back in and then till it into the soil. All right, thank you everybody. I'll go ahead and I'm gonna stop recording.